C'est merci. Mesdames et messieurs, bonjour. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to our forum, which is going to be about major ports. And I've got to Mr. Putovelka, who's the Director General of International Section of uh, Ports. Thank you very much, cities and ports. Mesdames et messieurs, Ladies and gentlemen, members of the international maritime community here meeting in Brest, uh, in Finistère, or you, those of you who are following us online, ladies and gentlemen, speakers of this forum, which will be dealing with ecological transition in ports. So, so good afternoon and welcome, welcome here. Firstly, thank, I'd like to thank the French uh, authorities for having allowed AIVP uh, to uh, be part of this summit. It's a great pleasure to find ourselves here in this very special place in the Atelier des Capucins, which is a very symbol of relation between city and port, which is a shared relationship. Uh, it's present on about on the five continents. It represents about 100 uh, cities and ports and promotes uh, dialogues as, as catalyst uh, of, um, of sustainable development for the uh, cities and ports, um, uh, both uh, rivers and also oceans. We've also um, seen the emergence of the cr uh, climate crisis. We've seen the changes which have occurred, and we've seen uh, the changed uses of uh, populations. In 2019, our members adopted uh, Agenda AIVP 2030, that is for the development of sustainable uh, cities uh, on the port and cities, and uh, we. this is based on the United Nations, and this uh, standard makes it possible today, thanks to the experiments which have been carried out locally by our members, uh, to 
offer answers to the questions which today we are discussing in this room today. Now, how in our port cities can we face climate change and the threat to biodiversity because the two phenomena are, of course, very closely linked? How can we combine efficiency in economic terms and quality of life for the people who live there? What new developments do we need to introduce into our port cities in order to have a bluer economy, one which is based on, and to do this, we will have a three stage with the with with the uh, the have Kobe uh, and with uh, Lagos with the uh, Nigeria as well. There will be and also with Quebec. We'll also have an exchange on the uh, change, and we will have Long Beach, Barcelona, Barcelona, and Singapore. These uh, cities will also have an opportunity, and ports will have an opportunity to express their views. Uh, we'll listen to Mario Girard, who is the vice president of AIVP, who will be talking from Canada, addressing us from Canada. So, in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, the French authorities and European authorities as well would like to present the latest initiatives which have been undertaken to decarbonate and uh, to update uh, and uh, these ports and also for 55 uh, package. Uh, I will be the moderator. Uh, it will be my pleasure to moderate this round with the director, Mr. Sanchez, who is responsible for the content in IVVP. I would like to thank uh, all the speakers uh, to please stick to their speaking time because uh, we haven't got much time and um, uh, some people, you know, we know they had to get up very early and other people we know it's very late for them. So I'd like to invite the three uh, distinguished personalities uh, who will be speaking this afternoon. Please come up here, Mr. Stéphane Redon, Mr. Hervé Martel and Madame Marianne Okeke. Please come up to the podium, would you? Uh, please come up and take your seats up there. Thank you very much indeed. I would like to suggest uh, that we get, we get uh, into the heart of the subject and we start uh, this tour de table of port cities. Uh, we've got someone who's not very far from here, Mr. Stéphane Redon, who is the director general of Aruba Port, uh, which is a new French port, uh, Haruba Port, uh, which is you know, uh, on the bringing Port, uh, Le Havre, Rouen, and Paris are the Seine, the ports of the Seine River. So thank you very much. Welcome here uh, to Brest. Uh, about 50% of the ports are made up of natural space, uh, and ports today have terrific responsibility in the preservation of biodiversity, both uh, of the seashore and of the sea, and it is established that certain ecosystems, as we talked about them a lot in the different sessions today, uh, in the One Ocean Summit, the OOS, uh, this ecosystem is uh, uh, the they, uh, some of these systems uh, are essential. Uh, they are essential as uh, uh, um, waterlogged areas uh, uh, for biodiversity. So how can we preserve these? Areas? How can we also uh, do this in view of uh, biodiversity uh, protection and also climate change? Thank you very much, Bruno. Firstly, I'd like to say thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much for having come to Brest this afternoon on a rather sunny day. As you can see, uh, we've got a lot of uh, uh, the, the climate changes very quickly in Brittany. Uh, the, uh, and I'd like to talk about uh, different experiences that we've had. So I carried out uh, my functions out uh, uh, in uh, metropole, in metropolitan France and also abroad in uh, France uh, for foreign um, uh, territories. Uh, the two, when we talk about this, I'd like to think about Dina. Dina it was the cyclone in the reunion in 2002 and Gincha in 2010 in France. So the major port uh, of, uh, of the port of Rio Maritime that I've been, been directing uh, since uh, this last uh, summer, I've been in charge of it. This is an object uh, which is unusual uh, administrative terms. Uh, that is, goes from Paris and up to Le, uh, Le Havre and more than 300 kilometers uh, um, with both land and coast. Uh, 
questions. Uh, they actually join up one another, and it shows uh, that uh, it's very important to have interaction. And as we have now been set up, we are, of course, based on a national stra port strategy. This was validated in January 2021 by the government and the prime minister in the Havre, the 1st of January 2021. And so we are going to be showing this responsibility around climate change and the preservation of our environment. Um, climate change, well, this is uh, a very strong factor. Just a few days ago, we were discussing this uh, with our colleague from Meteo France just a couple of days, uh, just a couple of minutes ago. Something happened in Batira. Batira is not, uh, Batira is the latest cyclone which happened in the uh, Indian Ocean. More than 80 people died in Madagascar. And it uh, is uh, uh, led to a, a break in the supply chains. Uh, and uh, there was also events in Réunion. So I think that this uh, means that climate change uh, is something that's proven and uh, that the Paris Agreement is something we've got to face up to in the years ahead. Now, the uh, uh, region, we are setting up a plan for climate change, which we're adapting to climate change. And this is going to be working on new infrastructures. It's going to be working on all risks, uh, uh, that's of coast risks and also risks uh, of, of the uh, rivers. And this is also going to be working on ways in which we can uh, survey what's going on and monitor them. And also the plan for a future, the awareness of risk, all of this uh, to be able to create resilience. Uh, this is what we're looking for. We're looking for resilience uh, every day. So what does this mean? It means uh, we have got to converge on three principles. Next year we'll be celebrating the 70 years of 1963, 2,800 people died in Holland and uh, the Netherlands uh, with a huge uh, tempest at sea, a storm at sea. So we've got to have the memory of risk. So this is something uh, we've got to know. Uh, we've got to share this with other maritime nations. Also, we've got to have extremely important action with the services of the state and also the protection of our seas and shores. So when we're talking about this risk protection, we're doing this with regard to biodiversity as well. 16,000 hectares, that's more than 4,000 hectares of protected areas, protected spaces. These are very important plans with regard to um, ecological change, particularly gas. Um, Gap carbon uh, gas because we launched with the presence of Wati Jabari last October um, a major plan to capture, capture CO2. So biodiversity, climate change are completely uh, linked in our new model, and this is what we're developing. We are developing it, and this is what we will be developing in the years ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Raison. And uh, now we start our world tour, as Bruno was saying going to far away to Japan, where the municipality of Kobe has expressed ambition to become a sustainable, a sustainable city in the post-COVID recovery. And at the same time, they have also developed the uh, waterfront area of Shoku. So we asked the mayor, Mr. Hisamoto Kitso, to tell us more about this fascinating project, um, particularly how they were able to do it in an environmentally friendly way. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kizo Hisamoto, and I am the mayor of Kobe, Japan. First of all, I would like to congratulate you on organizing this very important summit. Today, we, our city will participate in a forum on Port City's green transition. And I would like to say that it is a great honor and pleasure for us to have been invited to speak on this topic. As you may know, the Japanese government has pledged to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. Now hydrogen is widely believed to be one of the most effective tools in our fight against global warming, and thus we have decided to prioritize this field by starting the Hydrogen Smart City Cove Initiative. 
Furthermore, we are also carrying out a number of blue carbon projects and aiming to develop a port into a carbon neutral facility. We also strive to provide shore-side electricity supply and encourage private companies to develop cutting-edge hydrogen technologies. The city of Kobe is located on the slope of the Rokko Mountains in Western Japan. And after the opening of a port to international trade in 1868, the city has developed into a major international hub. Unfortunately, in 1995, our city was devastated by the Great Hanshin Aoji earthquake, but we were able to rebuild everything thanks to the extensive support we have received from all around the world. It is my sincere hope that our various current projects will in turn prove useful to many people around the globe. On a separate note, I would also like to mention that we have been sister cities with the city of Marseille for 60 years now. And we are determined to continue developing our cultural, business, and port exchanges, further strengthening the relations between our countries. Once this pandemic is behind us, I would be delighted to welcome you all to our city so that you can have a look at some of our projects and enjoy our diverse nature, delicious Kobe beef, and our famous Japanese sake. In closing, please accept my best wishes for the continued development of your countries, municipalities, and organizations. I hope that this summit will prove very fruitful for everyone in attendance. Thank you very much for your kind attention. So we are very thankful for the testimony of uh, the mayor, Mr. Hisamoto Kitsu, and particularly his uh, delicious invitation to go to his to visit his city. But we still stay in, in Kobe, because as we have seen, it is an example, the port and city of Kobe are an example of resiliency, overcoming natural disasters. So we're going to, uh, to a live connection with the general manager of the port of Kobe, Mr. Noritaka Hasegawa. Good evening, Mr. Noritaka Hasegawa. It's a pleasure to have you live with us. Yeah, good evening. Yes, yes, good evening. I'm pleasure to see you. So, First of all, I would like to introduce some of the environment initiatives in the port of Kobe. Uh, Kobe City undertook a large scale run reclamation project in the port area in order to build the berth to accommodate a large container vessels. In addition to port facilities, the uh, reclaimed run. A number of urban projects. Uh, including a residential area, parks, hotels, convention centers, hospitals, sports centers, and airport. Uh, we currently work on two major projects. The first, to make our container terminal more efficient and convenient. And the second, to develop odd and difficult to use wealth inaccessible to container vessels. The most important as aspects of this project are sustainability and carbon neutrality, so that we both focus on the use of hydrogen to pro promote the decarbonization. In, it, in April 2018, we successfully spread a number of public facilities, such as sports center and hospital, with heat and electricity generated only from hydrogen fuel. By the time 2025, we expect to have a large-scale hydrogen station around uh, about 10,000 square meters in the container terminal area. In the future, we aim to expand the demand for hydrogen by spraying it not only to fuel cell vehicle but also to large trucks and vessels and large cranes. 
And uh, in the future, we'll make every effort to turn the port of Kobe into a global carbon neutral hub. And now, uh, let us move on to the second question of our climate change and the large scale disaster. Uh, in the wake of the Great Hanshin Average Earthquake, which struck our city in 1995, 6,434 people lost their lives, and 640,000 houses were damaged. At the same time, even despite a scale of disaster, there were no casualties and no houses destroyed on this reclaimed area. And there is a reason for that. As we are implementing this reclamation project, our city government has surveyed the condition of the seabed, evaluated earthquake risks, and implemented countermeasures based on the most advanced knowledge, which back then exceed the national standards. For example, during the reclamation process, we have installed seismograph at three depths, developed new testing methods for measuring the ground strength and new technologies for ground reinforcement. Later, the technical standards for seismic motion were set by the national government based on the data observed by the seismograph installed in Kobe. In terms of countermeasures against massive waves caused by typhoons, she was uh, which does breakwaters have been constructed around the city and they can withstand even larger waves and earthquakes that may occur once in a certain years. It is expected that uh, we'll continue seeing these extreme natural events, including typhoons that will keep growing in size. Therefore, we will need to continue predicting these events and assessing their impact on the city based on the knowledge we have accumulated over the years. That's all. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. General Manager. On, on le voit, Kobe, and see that Kobe has experienced dramatic times, and we all know about those. Kobe has experienced resilience and could be uh, inspirational for other cities and so as to avoid any dramatic events. So we shall continue uh, our trip uh, around the world and here from Canada, Mr. Mario Gérard shall join us now from the situation um, in Quebec and is Mr. Gérard with us or not? Soon, I guess. Can you hear me? So, good afternoon, Mario, Mr. Gérard. You've been uh, managing one of the biggest harbor in Canada on the banks of the River Saint Laurent, and the harbor infrastructure are close to wetlands. So, what have you learned from the last uh, or latest developments of your harbor? And are you ready to meet the challenges ahead of us in terms of climate change and biodiversity? So what is happening really on the banks of the river Saint Laurent? Thank you very much, Bruno. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. It is really an honor to be with you. First of all, let me say that I am one of those who believe that we have actually failed, badly failed. And when I mean we, that is the community of the nations. And I think it is a collective failure, really. The failure is to have uh, let uh, things go so that now uh, things are really worsened by climate change to a being very detrimental. So we need to restore the habitats. And it is very important for the habitat. And that is similar to what biodiversity is to climate change. It's not too late for biodiversity, and we cannot uh, look elsewhere. It is possible to do that if we uh, commit ourselves now, in, if we engage into changing uh, our way of working. But of course, that may disturb behaviors and way of thinking of lots of people. Uh, 
would like actually to provide you with some insight. I spent some of the last decade to draft and uh, to work on a draft project, which is a terminal harbor, uh, which is uh, pretty uh, minor with regard to others. Uh, roughly 30 hectares, a third of them uh, were within the remit of the actual uh, current uh, harbor infrastructure. So we worked uh, a lot with the best expert in terms of environment, biology, so as to propose uh, uh, eco uh, responsible uh, terminal using el electricity uh, powered by uh, hydrogen and more than 7 million kilometers uh, that are actually avoided on road. So we are providing some offset for 40% for each of the hectares uh, and millions have been spent for the conservation and preservation of fishes. So it's a responsible modern project, but for several reasons this project will not be uh, come to life, really. So what would we do? What would we do? The same things, really. If I were to think within the same frame or way of thinking, yes, we would do the same, absolutely, because, of course, never things had been done with so much uh, goodwill. But if I now think out of the box, and if I now <coughs> try to think out of the silo and to think differently. I have a different viewpoint. Can I, as a chairman of a public harbor, think what is different? What are the immediate consequences for our community or a sensitive ecosystem? Could we think that nature, na protected nature has as well a value? If I renounce to a given potential of development and if another harbor uses that space, have our children benefited from that? I think we need to actually ask the real questions. Has a harbor city well, actually uh, there to ask those questions because we uh, have one leg in the marine environment and another one in the uh, land in the Germans. We need to commit ourselves to do the development that is possible without being detrimental for species which have been there for hundreds of years. If we believe that we need to protect biodiversity, it becomes very hard to uh, move back. And, uh, that is my main message, really. We need to think out of the box. We need to promote what was not promoted before for the best benefit for our children. That's the kind of development and I want to foster and promote in the future. Of course, that won't be easy, but if not possible, actually. But within the same corridor, several groups or several unions, elected representatives do recognize the value of biodiversity and accept as well to think out of the box for the greatest benefit for us all, really. I could say that's what we lacked. That was the gap in our management in terms of uh, climate change. We have uh, an area which has not uh, been uh, used in urban development. It's Most of it is wetland. And we know the actual ecological value of this uh, land. And we thought it would compensate that wetland and would recreate another marsh. And no, uh, we shall not do that. We're going to try, actually, to uh, maintain and preserve and promote that wetland, so the marshes, and, and we shall promote the rest of it in order not to be detrimental to this environment. I think we cannot reproduce the failures we have done of the uh, we had with regard to climate change. So we have several filters. Our first school fist uh, must respond to the environmental test, then the social acceptance test, and the business or economic acceptance tests. Um, so we could move from the fair development uh, to a true uh, demands for the uh, future as it is recommended by the ABP. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Girard, for this uh, strong and ambitious uh, message that you have delivered. And we continue our session right here in our room 
uh, with uh, another guest, Mrs. Uh, Marianne Okeke, who is Senior Environmental Manager from Nigeria Port Authority. Thank you very much for joining us here uh, and taking the long trip. So Nigeria Port Authority has been developing different actions to protect local biodiversity from invasive species. This is a common problem in many port cities around the globe. Mrs. Okeke, could you please explain us a bit more about the actions that your organization is taking in this direction and how do they connect the national strategies with the local ones in the protection of biodiversity? Thank you very much. Um, thank you um, to the organizers for inviting me and Nigerian Ports Authority to this um, auspicious occasion. One Ocean Summit. Um, Nigerian Ports Authority, we cover, um, is a federal government owned, and um, we are under the Federal Ministry of Transport. And um, we have been moving towards um, protection of our environment because um, the act gave us, um, the act of Nigerian Ports Authority gave us a lot of land all over Nigeria. And um, how do we protect what needs to be protected? And then one of the things Nigerian um, Authority did was to uh, develop um, the Environment Department in 1994. And um, we, we didn't have it prior to 1994. And then uh, began training um, staffs, um, sending staffs both locally and internationally. Um, so that um, today we have quite a lot of people well trained um, to bring the vision of uh, the port in protecting the environment. And um, recently, the federal government last year signed the, um, the updated national determined contribution uh, to the IMO on the, um, 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 to the United Nations um, on sustainable development. We find that our activities apart from um, the ballast water um, problem, our activities we are also affecting biodiversity. And when you look at what are the activities that uh, um, affect biodiversity, in my research, um, I have carried out several research on the Lagos Harbor and the um, entire this year on the biodiversity of the benthic macrofauna. And um, we find that, of course, the fragmentation, destruction of um, the habitat. And of course, through uh, dredging, um, it's affected. And then we also find that um, pollution. Uh, as is, um, you all know, in most third world countries, and uh, Nigeria, for example, there's a saying locally that water has no enemy. Um, people tend to empty their waste into uh, the water, and it is the responsibility of Nigerian Post Authority to keep the channel open uh, for navigation. And we find that um, pet bottles and uh, plastic waste was a problem. And uh, you know, um, surrounding the port is um, uh, nursery beds for f uh, faunas and floras, and um, these pet bottles and uh, plastics, we're um, like smoldering them. So one of the things we have been doing, one sensitization, we have been collaborating with Lagos State Government. Incidentally, uh, Mr. Tunji Bello, that was here, had been uh, for years uh, the Commissioner for Environment, and I have been going to his office for meetings, and in term, um, because of um, waste, um, entering the municipal waste, um, entering the Lagos Harbor through the uh, Lagos Lagoon Complex. And um, we have been collaborating to remove uh, waste from um, the water 
clearing the plastic uh, waste, which uh, we found, uh, I mean, it's, it's really horrible when you look at it, and we have been able to clear the water. I wish I had pictures to show you how it was and how it is today. And we continually uh, do that at least four times a year. And uh, we collaborate not only with Lagos State government, um, the, com uh, the uh, Commissioner for Environment, we also collaborate with other um, um, agencies um, within the Transport, Federal Ministry of Transport, because um, like we said, the biodiversity is very important to, for uh, the fisheries. Another thing that's causing um, biodiversity problem within the um, Nigerian ports as is, um, overfishing. As you know, we, our population is ever increasing. And like we have um, all said, around the port area, Nigerian Port Authority, apart from employing about 5,000 people, uh, 4,000, roughly 4,000, um, has over a million people depending on the ports uh, within Nigeria. And um, people overfish, that's the truth. Our population is growing by trip and bound. Uh, in the next, um, by 2050, Nigeria is, um, have been projected to be the third largest um, nation in the world. So you can imagine the amount of people um, uh, fishing, um, doing all, all sorts of fishing this day. And how do we, how is Nigerian ports um, trying to overcome this? Um, helping people to, um, people depending on the water. It's okay, okay. I'm sorry, we, we have a very busy session, so we need to move forward. Don't want okay. to be rude. No, no trouble. Okay, let me just go on to the ballast water management. Uh, yeah. Can we leave that perhaps to the end for some questions? Okay. Because we have uh, uh, our live connection with South America and they are also waiting, so I, don't want, I want to avoid a diplomatic incident. All right. Apologies. <laughs> no trouble. So, uh, but again, I think you, you, you hit very crucial points about the issue of collaboration, taking responsibility, and I think the saying of uh, uh, water has no en enemy, I think is an excellent mantra that uh, we should take, uh, I at least I would take as a carry home message uh, for myself. So, uh, but as I was saying, we need to, to move forward because we're running out of time. And we go to a live connection directly with South America. Uh, with I'm sorry, there is a change in the program. So, your technicians must be tired. We don't have the proper connection with Peru. So I would just like to come back to uh, two points, two things that were said. We heard about from the uh, harbor of Kobe and the link they have with Marseille, the city of Marseille and the harbor of Marseille. And we've had also a different statement made by Mr. Gerard on how to manage the harbor projects. Uh, on this two points, Mr. Martel, would you like to tell us what is being done in Marseille in terms of biodiversity and what is your reaction? Very briefly, uh, before we can get a proper connection, I would like to say that I'm very happy to meet once again the, both the French and international maritime community here in person in Brest uh, today at the harbor of Marseille. I think we have changed our viewpoints. Uh, a couple of years ago, biodiversity was actually a curb to uh, the development of project. Now it's actually a true um, common stake in all ports development. So uh, the harbor of Marseille is for part uh, within the city of Marseille, and it covers uh, 10,000 hectares within the Bay of Force and wetlands in the Carmarg area and the drylands in the uh, plain of Caux, 300 uh, animal species, uh, some of which are protected, 400 uh, plant species. Um, there's a wealth, really, of biodiversity, so we chose not to do any uh, infrastructure development of 3,000 uh, hectares, and these are very sensitive uh, areas, and we are managing and protecting uh, these natural areas. It's uh, one of our tasks. We are doing some investments so to do that to offset as well 
uh, of uh, developments. And we do that on a voluntary basis. And uh, really enjoyed what Mario said. That doesn't mean that we're not developing the, uh, the port of Marseille invested a lot in order to have a very precise and fine uh, uh, knowledge of the uh, stakes uh, and challenges pertaining to these uh, species uh, in these areas. So we are planning a 20 years long uh, program that has to uh, develop. Uh, both from the urban point of view, but also the uh, business point of view, uh, so as to develop all the uh, activities we want to do in this area, uh, but in the meantime, uh, preserving and maintaining the green corridors and the blue corridors so as to maintain the biodiversity, and we shall uh, base our development on the basis of this analysis for this uh, framework development, and uh, we shall keep this in mind. To uh, preserve the biodiversity, that's what I wanted to say today. Developing a port authority and its activity with all the ambitions we have in Marseille uh, cannot be, can, must be done uh, in conjunction with uh, preservation and the continuation of the biodiversity in this area on the coastline, but also in lands and in the wetlands and drylands. So we are operating very sensitive uh, natural areas. Uh, that was my main message, really. We can do both. Thank you very much. Business, but also development, but and, um, as you can see, the world tour, even if virtually, still has some technical challenges. Um, so uh, we're still going to try this connection with Peru. I believe we have the speaker ready. So um, with us, uh, live from Peru, is Mr. Juan Miguel de la Torre, who is environmental expert for the National Port Authority of Peru. And we we're supposed to have a second speaker, but unfortunately, uh, she could not uh, join us. So um, I believe he is hearing us. Yes, excellent. Muy buenos días. And uh, so the, uh, I, I jump immediately to the question to go a bit uh, faster. We also have with us Mrs. Edith uh, Tubayachi, who is also environmental expert in the same organization. And um, the National Port Authority of Peru approved in 2019 a new national port development plan. I believe Central there is a- and Western part of the South America continent. Peru has a population of 33 million inhabitants concentrating a third of this population in his capital, the city of Lima. Our country is considered of the most diverse in the world. It is developing and has made great progress in recent years. Our main economic activities are mining, hydrocarbons, natural gas, and agriculture. The port terminals during the, during the year 2021 mobilized 110 million metric tons, with an increase of 13.7% compared to the year 2020. As a recent introduction, we will say that in, in 2003, the law of the national port system was promulgated. This law created the National Port Authority. This organization is in charge of the development of the national port system, the promotion of private investment in the ports, and the coordination of the different public actors or private companies that participate in the port activities and services. Its objective is to establish and consolidate a solid community that links all developed agents. Accordingly, currently the national port system is made up of 101 port terminals, of which 54 are maritime, 44 are river, and three are lake. To continue, edit. Edit, please. Thank you, Miguel. About the environmental policies, uh, the state of Peru has a government structure that involves the partic participation of different entities in the prevention and promotion of environmental protection. As mentioned by Miguel, most of the ports in Peru are related to the transport sector, as well as the production, mining, and energy, which are the main economic activities in the country. Uh, for that, the, Envirom the Environment Ministry of Peru, as head of the National System of Environmental Management, provides the guidelines to each sector to establish the necessary tools to prevent the pollution and bring environmental protection during port operations. Those compromises are previously evaluated and approved by different environmental authorities and public entities and are diffused to the population and social organization to achieve the goals of environmental protection mainly related to environmental monitoring, training programs, and risk evaluation. 
in order to guarantee the protection of our biodiversity as well as the quality of life of population. One of the most representative cases is the port General San Martin in Pisco, which is located in the buffer zone of a national reserve. Their main operations include movement of bulk and general cargo as well as container, but this terminal is not allowed to move minerals, although it has the infrastructure, uh, and all those because Peruvian policies prioritize the biodiversity protection. It is important also to mention that uh, National Port Authority is an environmental control entity and its functions include the verification of the compliance of different compromises assumed by the port management. For that, the National Port Authority plans its activities at the Annual Plan of Environmental Evaluation and Fiscalization, which is a document approved annually and presented to the National Organism of Environmental and Fiscalization as the entity responsible for the National Environmental Control System of Peru. All supervisory actions that are carried out by National Port Authority are continuously reported to that organization. As important as the legal frame is the commitment of each own port management that brings great achieve and initiative. I would like to mention, for example, the cooperation between Peru uh, LNG and the Smithsonian Institute to develop the biodiversity monitoring and assessment program. This program includes evaluation and conducts long-term monitoring of species and habitats at the marine terminal of liquefied natural gas. Another important example is the private initiative in Callao uh, as the construction of a, a specialized port with encapsulated pipes to transport ore directly to the ship, avoiding the dispersion of toxic metals while transport and storage and considerably improving the environmental quality, as well as different concessional ports, terminals that are voluntarily voluntarily decided to reduce the carbon sign through an initiative of the environmental ministry, as such, DP World in Callao and Tisuri Matarani, Arequipa. All these actions demonstrate that the development of the core activities and the contribution to the economy of the region can also strengthen the environmental protection along the performance of their activities, improve living conditions in their areas of influence. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. As you can see, Technology, although advanced, still presents some challenges and uh, it is much better when we are together, much easier to have a, a proper dialogue. And we also have very motivated speakers that are able to respond to some questions even before we're able to, uh, to make them. So thank you very much for the commitment. And now we would like to move to the second part of the session where we're going to focus on the energy transition. Now the IMF has estimated in a recent study that de decarbonization of the maritime transport has an economic weight of around $105 billion per year. However, even more important than the new market opportunities is a fast and powerful development of decarbonization solutions for shipping to support the global effort against climate change, as we could see in the session this morning. Since the maritime shipping accounts at the moment only from 3 to 4 percent of the global greenhouse gas emission, we could eventually think that it has a limited role to play. However, our sector, environmental footprint, is growing fast, as the demand for maritime transport has exploded in the past years, as we have seen in the past couple of years, particularly during uh, the COVID time. And its share of the global greenhouse gases could reach between 10 to 12 percent during the next decade. So in the following panel, we will discuss with leading ports the new solutions and strategies that they are developing, including renewable energy sources, onshore power supply, alternative fuels, such as LNG or hydrogen, or even smart solutions to monitor the energy consumption. And as Bruno was saying in the beginning of the session, we're going to count with the testimonies of the port of Marseille, who's here with us, the port of Long Beach and Los Angeles, that are going to join us via video, and in the cases, from the cases of Barcelona, and Singapore that will also be joining us live via video conference. Thank you, Jose. Donc on, on va revenir à Marseille pour pas un interview. Back to Marseille. So that um, we can let you speak a little longer. Of course, you know, uh, Marseille is a very important point, a very important port in development, uh, uh, a, a, um, a circular economy, and also moving away from biocarbons. So everyone is different, but of course, everyone can learn 
from others. So we're going to start with our little world tour. We'll start with Marseille. Mr. Monsieur Martel, I called you Mr. Marseille, but actually your name, of course, Monsieur Martel. So please, would you just tell us more or less, that give us the outlines of what you're doing in terms of changing ecological change. Right, well, we talked about biodiversity just now, and the commitment for the Port of Marseille on the environment is also a question of pollution, atmospheric pollution, particularly with regard to activities which take place in cities, uh, in the city itself, uh, and of course, uh, on action to protect the planet with regard to uh, green greenhouse gases too. Now, many important f sub uh, subjects uh, I'd like to talk about uh, the key um, if we uh, plug in uh, ships which can then cut off their engines, uh, if we can use some electricity. So since 2017, we've had an experiment, we've been going for four years now, of uh, uh, also uh, in Corsica. And uh, uh, when, uh, when, so we've got, uh, we try to do this, we do this uh, in zero smoke um, uh, stopover. Uh, this is what we do. There's about two. And so we've got a lot of investment in this. And this is also part of about uh, 15 or so ports in the world uh, which provide high um, tension uh, electricity to our ships. Uh, so we are buying in uh, the volts. Uh, we transform 11,000 volts. Uh, and uh, we are able to do this, and we provide this service for our clients. And we're going to be extending it as well to activities of international ferries. Uh, by the end of this year, beginning of next year, we've got a, a new uh, team uh, and a new fleet, which will be equipped with that kind of uh, equipment. But also, we've got the same fleet, uh, about uh, two times higher. We're dealing with 1.5 megawatts uh, for ferries, uh, whereas it's going to be three to four to five megawatts uh, for these major ships, these huge ships, uh, which go to Maghreb, North Africa. And also the following stage, uh, by 2025, we're going to have cruise boats, cruise ships. Uh, and this is a technological step which is really important for us because we're talking about 12 to 18 megawatt uh, power. That's uh, uh, what we're doing much more today. And uh, these uh, are going to be up to the American standards uh, because they use um, 60 hertz. Uh, so we've got to convert from 50 to 60 hertz, uh, which, of course, for that kind of power we're talking about is a pretty complex operation. So by th 2025, we should be able to provide this service for cruise ships to the four ports of Marseille, which will make it possible to uh, to um, supply two ships at the same time. We'll multiply by four the power available on the port of Marseille in five years uh, from 16 megawatts uh, to 70 four or 70, 80 megawatts. And at the same time, we've decided to produce ourselves electricity, photovoltaic electricity, that is solar energy. And that requires that you've got to put people's, you've got to put our warehouses uh, with solar panels. We've also got to put in solar panels uh, 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 and we've got to have intelligent management of all this. But the good news is that uh, the sun is in the day. and. Uh, uh, so, although they, um, the cruise ships go out at night, uh, they're actually in the port in day, in the daytime. So, most of the energy will be provided by these services. So, I think it's 80 percent that will be. And uh, so, we, they have uh, as uh, 2025. Well, it will be. Um, there will be no pollution service because it'll either be natural gas or it will be provided by electricity as far as containers are concerned. But also, CSCM has decided to invest in. Uh, in uh, LG, LNG uh, container boats, container ships, uh, but also chose Marseille to Singapore for bulkering and uh, uh, with uh, natural gas. So we had the first commercial operation of uh, bulkering um, uh, for, with uh, LGN. And this means the point is to get to FOSS in December. In other words, we are ports today, are able to offer the service, offer the service of bulkering with natural gas. And of course, uh, uh, many um, shippers are interested in this. Uh, so we've got electric, electric we've got uh, NLG. So uh, in January, we, we signed with HWW to set, build a 
uh, a green hydrogen uh, factory. We're not talking about uh, ships anymore. We're talking about industries, okay. Uh, but uh, they, they want to, to decarbonate main industries, uh, that is, uh, petroleum, any other kind of uh, industries in the port and hinterland, and also to decarbonate transport de uh, this year. We have a project uh, which will be dealing with trucks on hydrogen, hydrogen fueled. We, we expect to have about 50 for next year, and then perhaps in the short future, in the near future, we will have maybe railways also doing this with the same system and ships as well. So this is the use of hydrogen. We want to inject it into the network of natural gas, which exists in France, but the main objective is to decarbonate the industry and decarbonate uh, uh, industry. Have you got one more minute? Because uh, just 30 seconds, I think that uh, the, this, uh, the new project this year will be floating, floating wind um, pumps uh, in at sea. They'll be floating. Uh, they're they're going to be huge. If you look at these um, installations, they're absolutely enormous. So we've got floats that they're 80, they're triangles of 80, Kilometer, 80, sorry, 80 meters per side, and they're as high as the Eiffel Tower. These, um, uh, these uh, wind pumps, and they, of course, it was a huge uh, uh, infrastructure required to do this. So, EDF has helped us, Golarge, on the port of Foss, uh, three first uh, pilot uh, fleet. We hope that they'll be at sea. Well, I mean, I'll stop there, but I mean, I could go on for hours and hours and hours because we've got a lot of uh, pilot uh, projects on the Foss region of the city of Marseille, uh, Marseille port. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for aiming at that. Uh, and uh, we are going to cross the Atlantic now. We're going to cross over to the Atlantic uh, and we're going to Long Beach, Beach United States. Uh, um, and uh, the two ports are together on the west coast of the United States, ports uh, which for a very long time were at the initiative of a conversion of electricity. So we will hear from the two uh, director general of these two establishments. Thank you. Hello, I'm Mario Cordero, executive director of the Port of Long Beach. I'm pleased to be part of this year's One Ocean Summit to have a chance to introduce you to my port and some of the measures we are working on to address climate change and other critical environmental issues. The Port of Long Beach, California is the second busiest seaport in North America. And we're also a leader in seaport sustainability. In 2005, after many years of rapid growth, the Port of Long Beach adopted its green port policy to commit wholeheartedly to environmental sustainability. This pledge led us to groundbreaking new programs to address our impacts. The port started to tackle every source of air pollution and water quality issues in our harbor. We committed to green technology, green growth, and building a culture of sustainability. We became the green port. To cut emissions from ships at birth, we pioneered and advanced the shore power technology that this conference is helping to spread to ports throughout the world. We've documented steadily improved water quality in our harbor with more than 1,000 species of aquatic plants and animals that call our harbor home. We built the world's greenest, most advanced container terminal with zero emission terminal operations. Since 2005, we have cut diesel emissions from port operations by 90%. Small causing emissions have been slashed. Greenhouse gases are down, all while cargo has increased. And we're not finished. We have embarked upon a new path, a path to becoming the world's first zero emission port. Cranes, forklifts, tractors, and other cargo handling equipment in our terminals must be zero emission by 2030. On-road trucking serving this port will be zero emission by 2035. These goals are designed to lower our greenhouse gas emissions by 40% relative to 1990 levels by 2030 and by 80% by 2050, aligned with the state of California goals. 
Currently, our port, we have $150 million worth of zero emission demonstration projects. Our terminal operators, longshore dock workers, and truck drivers are all helping us to test this new technology. These partners and other stakeholders deserve a great deal of the credit for cleaning the air. When, during the supply chain crisis, ships were stacking up outside the harbor, our industry partners acted to create a new queuing system, which has moved the waiting ships out of our air basin, helping to reduce local air quality issues. In April, we will begin charging a clean truck fund rate to encourage conversion to cleaner trucks and raise funds to help pay for that changeover. This system is expected to generate $90 million in the first year to support zero emission truck goals. With our many green programs, we continue to make the port, harbor waters, and neighboring communities, and the world a better place for coming generations. It is our responsibility, it is our duty. Thank you. The Port and City of Los Angeles commend President Emmanuel Macron for his leadership in facilitating the One Ocean Summit. And we fully support the important seaport-related emission reduction initiatives that are the focus of this valuable forum. In 2004, Los Angeles became the first port in the world to plug a container ship into shoreside power at birth. Since then, we've expanded our alternative maritime power program to include 81 shoreside power vaults at cargo and cruise ship terminals throughout our port. Every ship that runs on shoreside power over a 24-hour period eliminates vessel emissions equivalent to removing more than 35,000 vehicles from our Los Angeles roadways. The local and regional health benefits are substantial. While we've made significant progress to date, there's still much more work to do toward our goal of developing zero emission marine terminal facilities by the year 2030 and zero emission port drayage operations by the year 2035. Important forums like the One Ocean Summit will help our ports and cities effectively share and build on best environmental practices. At the confluence of supply chains, ports play an especially important role in this effort as they foster public and private sector collaboration. To that end, the Port of Los Angeles is very excited to partner with the Port of Shanghai and C40 Cities in the development of the world's first Trans-Pacific Green Shipping Corridor. In the coming months, we will work with industry partners on both continents, including marine terminals, shipping lines, and the cargo owners we serve to develop a blueprint for the future Green Corridor. Incentive programs like the Environmental Ship Index will help create future Green Corridors and drive blue tech innovation. Above all, Widespread collaboration will be the key to our collective success. Los Angeles applauds all the participants of the One Ocean Summit because your engagement will help fight climate change and create a more sustainable global environment for the benefit of future generations. The One Ocean Summit mission is critically important, and we thank you for extending the invitation for the Port of Los Angeles to participate. We wish you a successful conference and look forward to working with you. Well, this is an uh, ambitious and energizing message arriving from the other side of the Atlantic. And in the meantime, we continue on this side, on uh, Europe. We go to the port of Barcelona for a live connection directly with uh, Mr. Jordi Torrent, who is the head of strategy of the port of Barcelona. Hello, hello, Jordi. Yes, we hear you. Can you hear me? We hear you loud and clear. So, um, uh, shall I speak in English or French? Sorry. We, I think you can speak in English. Okay. Okay. So, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, so, um, thank you, thank you so much for inviting us to participate here in this in the in this summit. 
it's a really pleasure to be here. Um, I, I, I understand we have four or five minutes maximum, so I will go, uh, I will deep directly into the subject of, uh, let's say, decarbonization and energy transition. No? Okay. And basically, I will go very fast through our uh, four, five, six pillars of the strategy that we have recently approved, by the way, we approved our new strategic plan last year for the coming five years. And obviously, um, pushing towards that decarbonization of our port activity is one of the main drivers of this strategy. So basically, we are working in five, six different domains, very similar to what I heard from our good friends from the port of Marseille, uh, Los Angeles, and Long Beach. Obviously, Los Angeles and Long Beach in some of these topics are uh, a few years ahead of all of us, a few, a few years ahead of, of Europe, I would say. Um, but in general, I would say that we are doing uh, we are going all, with, all of us on the same direction. No? So basically, these four or five pillars are the following. Uh, first, like it was mentioned in the case of Marseille, uh, electrifying our terminals. And currently, we have only one, uh, one of our concessions electrified, which is the uh, concession, one of the concessions for uh, the maintenance of private yachts, where uh, those big uh, private yachts from those billionaires that come from the Arab world from Russia, etc., can be connected to the electricity while they are uh, birthed at the port. But we have approved, we approved last year a budget of 90 million euros in order to uh, develop, deploy onshore power supply in different uh, terminals, starting with containers, ferries, and cruise ships. In a few weeks ago, we tendered uh, the first project to deploy OPS in one of our container terminals. So hopefully, by the end of Next year, beginning 2024, uh, we will have the first, uh, we should have the first container vessels connected to electricity. Then we'll continue with, with ferries and uh, cruise ships in 2025, 2026. The second main, main driver or uh, sector where we will work um, in order to uh, deepen even more this decarbonization is the promotion of intermodality, very, very important. Um, most, almost all the lines connecting the port with our hinterland are electrified. We have been quite successful in, in recent years. We have approximately 15% of the containers that enter or leave the port they do it by train, 35% of the finished vehicles. So in the coming years, we want to increase this market share of rail uh, when it comes to uh, solid bulks, very important. We have every day couple of hundreds of trucks that come to the port to collect cereal, soya beans in order to be um, delivered in farms all over uh, Spain. So uh, attracting this traffic to rail, long distance, international. Yeah, unfortunately, we have been not so so successful no, in attracting uh, two uh, rail traffic that go beyond the Pyrenees. And uh, third, I would say short distance. Um, today, most of our traffic comes from destinations 100, 150, 200. 300, 400 kilometers inside the Iberian Peninsula. So we have different investments plan of rail terminals in locations 40, 50, 60, 70 kilometers from the port in order to be able to attract to rail this traffic that today goes by, by truck, obviously in electrified uh, lines. The third main driver is automation. Very important, we have one of our container terminals already semi-automated, uh, the machinery is connected to the electricity, um, and this has reduced enormously the pollution, CO2 uh, emissions in the air of our uh, surrounding area. So uh, pushing towards automa automation, automation of other terminals and other processes also is an important driver towards uh, decarbonizing the port activity. Fourth, um, generation of renewable energy in the port, basically, to solar panels, we hopefully uh, we are one the, the only port in the Mediterranean with a very big logistics uh, zone inside the port, more than 250 hectares of logistics uh, warehousing, uh, with almost one million square meters of logistic houses that we are uh, equipping with uh, solar panels, energy that will be used for the port or should be used, not yet uh, most of it, but should be used for uh, the port activity. Uh, five uh, driver, I only have six, so don't worry, I will keep it on, on time. Five driver, attraction of talent, 
when we speak about blue economy, uh, Barcelona is a place where, fortunately, we have very big uh, ecosystems of innovative ecosystems of different sectors. Um, but not unfortunately when we think about uh, ocean, oceans, blue economy, etc. So we have uh, we are developing several areas inside the port area in order to accommodate uh, startups, uh, small companies, innovative companies from the blue economy, and um, benefiting from other ecosystems um, that already exist here uh, in Barcelona, international ecosystems. And the last but not least, and this is not just for saying because probably it's the most important driver uh, for uh, decarbonization and energy transition, which is alternative fuels. And I say last and not least because everything is, uh, all what I have said till now is important, but uh, nothing compared to what would do for the decarbonization of logistics of the whole economy and of transportation to have alternative for, uh, fuels to fossil fuels. As we all know here today, there's not, doesn't exist uh, an alternative to LNG or fuel oil, or diesel oil, um, to be used massively by sea transportation. Uh, it's difficult to predict when will this be available, biofuels, methanol, um, ethanol, um, green hydrogen, ammonia, um, but as a port, uh, we take part in different research projects in order to push, no? because we cannot be the leading actors here, this more uh, from the regulatory side and from the shipping line side, no? in order to push for the development of those alternative fuels to fossil fuels. In the meantime, in the meantime, in the port, um, we have been betting in the past for um, uh, providing LNG, which is good to fight uh, certain the presence of certain pollutants in the in the city. Not so much obviously for climate change, but um, we had last year more than 200 calls uh, bunkered with LNG in the port, both from barges and from trucks. Um, this year, with the with the recovery of the cruise industry, this we expect to increase at least by 50 percent these calls with LNG as well, because we have lots of cruise ships that. Uh, come with uh, LNG, also container vessels, also ferries, and also other alternatives. We have already some ferries that, when they do uh, short calls in the port, they look bad. They use batteries for three, four hours, so they don't have the engines running while they are in port, only for short calls. But obviously, all this is only a transition towards an alternative fuel that we hope uh, will come. Uh, sooner than later. Um, I, I insist, I cannot predict when this will, uh, will, will be, but uh, let's hope that with all the uh, investment coming from the European Union, with the net generation funds, with all the uh, new regulations uh, being uh, put in place in Europe in the next two, three years, with all the investment being done by shipping lines, etc., we'll have this uh, sooner uh, than later. I've gone quite fast. I hope the translators didn't have a lot of problems in being able to translate this into French. I leave it here. Uh, thank you very much again for inviting us to participate in this session. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Terence. Uh, I'm sorry, but we're really running in an extremely fast uh, pace. So um, all these initiatives, of course, uh, have been mentioned in AABP publications. So I invite you later to visit our website where you can find also more information uh, where we have also explored these with interviews and articles with different experts. So um, now we continue our ambitious uh, world tour to Singapore, where um, we're going to learn, uh, we're going to uh, see how the um, CEO from PSA International, Mr. Tang Chong Men, uh, explains to us uh, how uh, is his company and how, what solutions is his company proposing to uh, achieve this goal on energy transition and achieving a zero carbon city. Good day to all distinguished guests, government leaders, and our partners in the ports and shipping industry. Firstly, I would like to thank the International Association of Cities and Ports, AIVP, for inviting me to the One Ocean Summit. Unfortunately, with COVID-19, I'm not able to be with you physically. Nonetheless, it is truly an honour to have the opportunity to speak to you on a topic that is close to our hearts and to share with you my thoughts on a green transition for ports, 
particularly on our energy transition journey, aiming towards zero carbon port city. In our sustainability transformation journey, PSA has been taking a proactive approach towards energy transition by firstly, changing the way we use energy and secondly, seeking new energy pathways. In relation to changing the way we use energy, we are engaged in a plethora of actions to increase energy efficiency wherever possible, including specific examples like the development of energy management systems such as smart grid and adopting just-in-time concepts to optimize vessel arrivals. As we plan and develop our Tuas Megaport in Singapore, we are incorporating next-generation designs for an intelligent, sustainable and green port. Starting with the reuse of excavated and dredged materials to reclaim land for the building of the port, using eco-friendly building materials is also an important feature. PSA has developed a sustainable concrete framework to reduce the embodied carbon footprint of our construction projects, which can provide carbon emissions savings of up to 50% for reinforced concrete, while also increasing the durability of the concrete itself. The Tuas port will also feature smart technology, such as automation and digitalization, to make it more productive, energy efficient, and sustainable. On new energy pathways, we have made several significant strides in areas such as accelerating the electrification of our equipment, trialing LNG as an interim clean fuel, and test bedding alternative energy vectors such as hydrogen. PSA Antwerp, for example, has begun trials with a hydrogen powered tractor and mobile hydrogen refueling station. Now, in the industry, there is now greater recognition that sustainability and tackling climate change will require a whole-of-system response. And through partnerships, we seek to be a catalyst for change in our industry. To this end, we have participated actively in industry-wide forums and action groups under the umbrella of the World Economic Forum, Global Maritime Forum and International Transport Forum to name a few key ones. And in 2020, we also joined the Coalition for the Energy of the Future, a global group of 17 companies with a collective goal to develop future energies and technologies to reduce the climate impact of transport and logistics. The Coalition now has 10 projects under development, including topics such as alternative fuels, zero emission vehicles, and intermodal green hubs. And besides these technological innovations, I also see great potential simply in working with partners to bring together solutions and co-creating an ecosystem where these solutions are underpinned by digital capability and made commercially more accessible. The latter will require further progress in carbon market mechanisms that could spur impact investing amongst community members to advance the goals of decarbonisation in ports and supply chains. We see a growing number of port cities taking assertive steps, sharing experiences and best practices, and galvanising relevant stakeholders in the maritime sectors to act on climate change and move towards net zero carbon systems. It is our strong belief that with these growing partnerships and collaborations, we can enable more sustainable trade and ultimately a better world. And with that, I wish you all the best of health and a fruitful time at the One Ocean Summit 2022. Thank you. We greatly appreciate the message from the CEO of PSA and we still uh, stay in Singapore, where we're going to have a live connection with uh, Mrs. Lei Hon Kwa, who is the CEO of the Maritime Port Authority of Singapore. So, as one of the three leading bankering ports in the world, the Port of Singapore is a crucial actor for the implementation of alternative fuels. 
We have seen that uh, you take this role seriously with the creation of the Global Center of Maritime Decarbonization. So can you please explain us how the Maritime and Port Authority of Singapore incentivizes the development of alternative fuels and what is your strategy to reach zero carbon calls in your port? Bonjour Bruno, thank you uh, once again for inviting Maritime and Port Authority of Singapore to join uh, you in this uh, One Ocean Summit. Now, as you have heard earlier from uh, PSA Chongming, uh, we are evolving from the industry from wind to steam, coal and liquid oil, and now we are in search for the next energy. And in Singapore, we focus on three key uh, aspects, connectivity, capex investment, or infrastructure and collaboration. I'll just add on to what you have heard from Chongming earlier from PSA. The first on connectivity really is about the role of a transshipment hub as well as a bunkering hub. Now, the physical connectivity itself, there's a lot of efficiency gained by transshipment itself. Imagine the amount of efficiency that can be gained and lost if you do not transport and do transshipment through a port and you go to, from a ship to different ports uh, without gaining that efficiency. Now, Singapore as a global hub port, we have, ne we have nearly 240 container services calling at our port. So when you use transshipment ports like Singapore, you are able to consolidate cargo on larger ships, you reduce the direct sailings between ports, and it cuts emissions from shipping. Now, as a port, we also layer physical connectivity with digital connectivity, and we hope that this will improve the efficiency with just-in-time, as what Chongming mentioned earlier, it can allow bunkering, repairing to take place very efficiently. And from our system that we have put in place, Digital Port SG, which is a one-stop portal for port clearance, it has already helped save the industry 100,000 man hours per day. Bruno, earlier you mentioned about using cleaner fuels in the port of Singapore. Indeed. So the port, just now you have heard in our terminals, how we've been using solar PV systems, LNG-fueled prime movers, electric-powered rubber-tired gantry gains to help to reduce port emissions. We are also building the Tuas port as a green and efficient port where we'll be using fully electric-powered container handling equipment. In terms of bunkering per se, we are working with different industry players in terms of collaboration, and that's my third C, on how we can get the different uh, players along the value chain to pilot possible solutions in on alternative green fuels, green ship designs, as well as engine construction. So we are like a living lab where pilot trials such as ammonia, biofuels, and even hydrogen will take place. On biofuels, we have already conducted a biofuel bunkering trial in our port with BHP and Good Fuels in 2021. And we are working very closely with licensed suppliers and value chain stakeholders to facilitate more such trials in the coming months. On Ammonia, we are a member of Castor Initiative, where alongside with industry partners such as MISC Berhad, Lloyd's Register, Man Energy Solutions, and Yara International ASA, will support the development and trials of vessels utilizing ammonia as an alternative marine fuel. And we hope to receive the first ammonia and also looking at building ammonia bunker tanker by 2025-2026. So as a port authority, in promoting a multi-fuel bunkering transition, we will continue to support operational trials as well as pilot deployment through regulatory sandbox. And this, for example, you've heard from the Global Centre for Maritime Decarbonisation, how we are going to build in and work with partners to develop standards for ammonia bunkering. We are also working with like-minded partners because you need a network of ports. So for example, with Japan and Rotterdam, under the Future Fuels Port Network, to develop the standards so that it can be elevated at an IMO level and ISO level for global use. So the three Cs is our, um, in terms of approach towards green um, shipping as well as green bunkering. Uh, and I hope that uh, it has provided some useful information for the forum. And thank you once again for the opportunity to share a little bit more about our initiative. And we hope that together with the industry and international organization, we can nudge forward the global, the future of global shipping sooner than later. Merci beaucoup. Thank you so much.
Mesdames et messieurs, donc on, on va arriver. Ladies and gentlemen, we're gradually doing, drawing to a close of this forum. So I'd like really to thank all the speakers. We've had one or two minor problems, uh, technical problems, and also we've had some problems with uh, uh, different, uh, you know, time zones. And so I'd also like to invite the minister uh, by to come up here, and also perhaps we'll give the we'll let Mr. Dubarry to come up here, and I think we've also got Madame Mad, Madam Adina Yonaveal, who is the European Commissioner for Transport, uh, and she is uh, paying us the great honor of being with us here today. So before I give them the floor, I would once again like to give the floor to the Vice President of AIBP, Mr. Mario Girard. He will be addressing us from Quebec, and he will give us a kind of resume. He'll give us a summary of the situation. I don't want to say anything more, Mario, uh, because um, I, I would uh, like to uh, give you the floor now. Thank you very much. Uh, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, as has been said before. So thank you very much. Thank you, Minister, Commissioner, ladies and gentlemen. It is a privilege to be able to address you again. We've been there, but this time I'm in Vice President of AIVP. And in order to go straight to the chase, and even if what I've heard today is very encouraging, I think that we are still very, and you will agree, we're still really uh, very much at the beginning. Uh, I, think, uh, the, uh, I think that we've missed a lot of opportunities uh, over the course of the years. Uh, in 1911, for example, and even before, we uh, started uh, to look at the situation with regard to, to uh, fossil fuels, uh, I think, uh, and uh, in a conversion. I would like to say when 2012, it was, uh, well, 1912 was when the t Titanic sank. And so if we look at what we were capable of, I think that there are many decisions, and we need to take necessary decisions now to avoid a kind of a shipwreck as well. For more than 100 years today, we have uh, been moving more uh, coal and uh, oil, and we have increased our use of this. And we've also increased our energy needs with regard to development uh, uh, to a level of comfort that we would never have been able to imagine. Our ancestors and our forebears would never have been uh, able to imagine. But what price, at what price? Uh, if we look at 80% uh, of uh, uh, energy consumed in the world is fossil fuels. Uh, now, renewables, uh, they are increasing, of course, uh, but um, we do we have to wait until you know something terrible happens before uh, we avoid the iceberg? So we've got to look ahead. Just imagine a, a given situation. Uh, imagine value being attributed to the uh, to restoring rather than exploiting the environment. If we're able to say that we're able to decarbonize our ports uh, and we'd be able to generate uh, uh, millions and billions of dollars by restoring the environment, let's try to look at things from a different viewpoint. I was saying recently that at the time of mammoths and the last ice age, the average temperature of the planet uh, was uh, only four degrees. Uh, and that was uh, winter, uh, but this is ongoing winter. Now we've got uh, one degree more with regard uh, to the uh, beginning of the industrial area, and we've seen that there's been an accelerating of natural catastrophes, natural disasters, uh, which often uh, affect uh, the ports uh, and port areas. Uh, four degrees left <laughs> is uh, uh, ice age, and one degree more is catastrophe. That means that every tiny amount of degrees uh, of cl uh, it means uh, has a huge effect. Any kind of any kind of increase in, or decrease in temperature has a huge effect. So we need uh, to look at the situation. Let's look at. Um, uh, we've got to really try to reduce our energy consumption, as we did during lockdown and due to COVID. We need to do this uh, in order to be able to go ahead. We've got to uh, try to preserve uh, uh, social peace, uh, but c sacrifices will be necessary because they won't be able to get to our goals by 2050. And uh, I think we're really not on that path now. We need to be ready to manage the changes of climate change, uh, hoping that one day it will be possible to reduce them and to reduce our emissions, uh, natural emissions, slow down climate change, 
all of this is essential. It's essential, and the AIVP will continue absolutely uh, ruthlessly to continue to do this uh, and to obtain our final objective. What is our objective? Well, what we want to do and what we need to do is to preserve our environment, the preservation of inhabitants uh, and to protect biodiversity. Uh, that is essential. If we continue at the, what we're doing, it's a uh, one million uh, of uh, threatened species which will disappear in the years to come. A lot of people here who will be capable of drawing a difference in a microscope between all kinds of different uh, animals and insects. A lot of people can't do this. Uh, human beings are similar. After all, we are like stardust. And if uh, the planet were to become a uh, in uninhabitable for one species, uh, this would not necessarily be a great advantage for others, uh, because we uh, these these uh, species which disappear are like the canaries down the mine, which indicate danger. So we need uh, to say that this biodiversity is essential. I mean, we know that um, drugs are made out of uh, serpent uh, poison, out of all kinds of things, uh, uh, and today. If three to five percent of animal species are, that are threatened by distinction, and a third of fish, uh, fish is is overfished, so the world is being around. Is Canada's protected plant, which would like to protect. Uh, 25% of its uh, ocean coasts uh, uh, by 2025. Uh, and uh, last year, the United Nations uh, called uh, nations uh, to take urgent measures to protect biodiversity. We need to respond to this appeal. We need to meet this challenge. Uh, a few years ago, I spent uh, a I went through the Northwest Passage on a scientific uh, um, trip to the Arctic, Arctic, and I was um, absolutely, uh, absolutely, uh, completely um, over. T I was completely hit by the huge uh, um, uh, effect of the boat beauty, but also the fragility. And uh, you know, it's taken millions of years for this to be set up. And today, we've got we've got thousands of ships going through this Northwest Parish. We need to reduce uh, uh, greenhouse gases. Uh, and once again, I think, what is the price uh, of doing this? Can we be responsible? Uh, the uh, ecosystems are maybe completely destabilized, uh, maybe even devastated and ruined. Uh, so our organisation, AIVP, thinks the time has now come uh, to press down the accelerator with regard to stopping the destruction of the environment. We think that we've now get to, we've got to move out of our present uh, uh, logic of compensation. It's not true that uh, if we plant uh, uh, um, fifth, trees which take 50 years to grow, it'll make up for what uh, the destruction today and other greenhouse gases of today. And uh, we can't think that we will protect our energy now by protecting uh, so protecting areas elsewhere. This, this objective and this logic doesn't work anywhere. So we've got to think now. AIV Pi would like uh, uh, to to uh, absolutely ban uh, any destruction of uh, de of uh, destroying the biodiverse systems in our radar ports. Uh, we want to not to do this uh, to destroy to uh, to build new ports, but we want to absolutely make sure that we enhance our our, uh, our areas around this uh, areas of biodiversity. We also believe that we need to honour our commitment with regard to transparency, and we need to publish reg reg regular uh, updates on the situation of biodiversity in order. We need to do this with regard to building the ports, which we'll be following. Don't let's forget uh, outside events, uh, s events in society, which mean that we've got to respect the health of populations. This is another subject which is absolutely essential uh, to the uh, the ideas of AIVP. Let us act with the, po the, po the, the, the public. Let us be serious. Let us be brave. And let us be hopeful as well. We need to think about measures to protect our biodiversity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mario, for this. And this is a new way of looking today at a relation of, uh, and to develop a, an ecological port. So in numerous places of the world, they have shared their ambitions on the five continents. We talked about uh, reducing the carbon footprint. This is, of course, a major challenge. And I shall leave you the floor. Uh, Mr. Minister of Transportation.
Merci, merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your warm welcome. Uh, dear Adina, Commissioner, we met in Toulouse recently, talking about the plant industries. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, free man, you will cherish the sea, has said Baudelaire. In order to cherish the sea, you must uh, cherish the doors that lead to the sea between land and the sea, between the waves and the continent uh, exist the ports and harbors, those links that exist between us and the harbors, and therefore the world they are the heart of our centuries and our logistic hubs, and we must uh, transform them. We do need them. Uh, in maritime uh, transportation represent 30% uh, of uh, commercial flow, that represent also 30% of CO2 emissions. This uh, figure is alarming, really. It uh, commands us to uh, act now. And as what was said by the former uh, speaker, we cannot wait anymore. Uh, producing the carbon footprint must be done for all modes of transport, uh, both uh, our, on land but also in uh, at sea and in the air. But today at sea, this uh, decarbonation, reducing the carbon footprint, has uh, started. Uh, uh, automotive uh, manufacturers have started to do so, and uh, uh, ship owners and uh, manufacturers as well have created to do so, and Jacques Saadé uh, in Marseille at the James Jachidé has actually launched a new uh, liquefied natural gas uh, ship uh, recently, and we have adopted a strategy for our ports, so as to green our harbor. And we now have some electric charging stations at the different berths with this new plan, we've got 45 million euros to grow, and by 2028, the our three main port, and I can see the managers of that, that of Aropa, Marseille, and that of Dunkerque, that represent 80 percent of the uh, uh, flow of uh, uh, containers and uh, cargoes uh, will be uh, equipped with uh, electric charger at birth on the keys. And that can be measured because, of course, connecting a ship reduce the CO2 emissions by more than 80 percent. We are not here talking uh, purely about something which is abstract. We're talking about uh, improving very practically the quality of the air of the port city, as we're talking really about the health care of millions of inhabitants within uh, the remit of both uh, port cities. Of course, uh, the decarbonation is taking place at the Europe scale, and it's one of the priority of the print residency of the European Union. We shall deploy the uh, uh, electric uh, charging stations in all European uh, birth as it is planned for the 55 uh, package, and we uh, agreed in Glasgow to develop uh, maritime corridors. So, of course, the green ecological transition must not be done uh, on behalf of the economic uh, efficiencies of our ports. So we make sure that our small ports and our ports overseas can have a specific uh, pathways to offset voice. And we are not starting from scratch, really, but we want to go uh, beyond and further, not only as the states, but also and mainly the ports, the port authorities, but also the uh, terminal operators, but of course the states commit themselves, the states are helping you, they support you, but the port and the port authorities uh, uh, must be the drivers for this uh, big movement so as to reduce the carbon footprint. The states will not install the electric charging station, the states will not create the green corridors in the future that will reduce the carbon footprint of maritime transportation, but the uh, actors and the uh, international level will do so. This is why this declaration is important, because we do need the commitment and engagement of the ports. And today you're committing yourselves uh, together with this uh, one ocean summit, uh, and with the we are we shall hear from the French President of the Republic tomorrow, but we just want to show the example. And on behalf of the French government, I'm providing my support to the common declaration of will so as to reduce the carbon footprint and to reduce the, the environmental impact of the coal. By 2028, I want to pay tribute to my counterparts who supported this declaration, the European Bank for Investment for its uh, instrumental investment and the ports and ports authorities who have already signed that uh, commitment to all of you and those of you who have not signed it yet, it's never too late to do well and uh, I thank you in advance for doing so.
Thank you, Mr. Minister Jean-Baptiste Trebari. And I think the uh, whole city will thank you, those of today, and that in the future, and those inhabitants who live there or uh, nearby. And Mr. Commissioner, you have the floor now. So thank you very much for the second time. It's a great pleasure for me to be here with you, Mr. Minister, ladies and gentlemen. It is always a pleasure to be with you. Uh, this is an historical city. It is an inspirational place, an inspirational location as we are looking at the future of the ports, the cities within the uh, remittance context of the green transition today. The port of Harbour is experiencing a diversity of activities, uh, containers, carriers, cruise ships. It's important in the region and for the European transportation is being recognized. When in last December, we uh, and upon the initiative of uh, the French government, and we made a proposal to include the port of Brest within the central network of RTOT. So congratulations. It was uh, my pleasure to visit uh, it this morning. It is well integrated indeed to the city, but the impact of the harbor to local communities is uh, very important, of course, uh, and uh, they provide uh, jobs, jobs for local communities, especially in the shipyards, uh, in tourism, and their impact is uh, experienced, uh, of course, inland as well. Uh, in as uh, the Blue Economy Report says, the added value generated by ports at it is has increased by 15 percent between 2009 and 2018. At the scale of the European Union, the sector employs more than 310,000 people in handling activities and storing activities, and nearly 200. 1,000 people um, working in other harbor activities. I, I'm just stating those figures. I, I guess you know much more uh, and well than me, but it is very important. I consider that this uh, transition must be sustainable, must be even more sustainable, and this is an opportunity to strengthen even further the partnership that exists between the harbors and the city's division for the ports is clear that it can provide uh, uh, and can be a source of uh, clean energy for the ships to import a clean energy such as hydrogen, hydrogen which will be used elsewhere, and also being actors and providers of efficient and clean uh, operations, uh, i.e. we must uh, trans transforming the port into a clean port will be a catalyzer for both the ports, but also for a booster for the cities uh, as well. That will also drive a uh, new investments, which will in turn lead to a new growth uh, within the harbor, but also in the vicinity of the harbor and the city. So the European Commission is supporting the harbors in their transition. It is helping them to increase that transition. Last summer, I proposed different proposals pertaining to sustainable fuel and infrastructure within the remit of the uh, Fit for 55 package. And the maritime flow will allow to stimulate the development, agricultural development of uh, green fuel. It will uh, allow for uh, clear obligations as regard the use of uh, energy by the different vessels, uh, which will uh, be put in place uh, progressively in time and following uh, rational as regards to the uh, technological neutrality. Another proposal pertaining the alternative fuels will uh, demand uh, from the ports that they actually uh, make available for the vessels uh, enough uh, uh, electricity for uh, the supply uh, at uh, birth uh, when they are uh, in the city. So these are very ambitious uh, proposals, but they must be done. They are necessary not only uh, to mitigate the climate change consequences, but also to mitigate the pollution in ports and for the local communities, uh, well-being and health, generally speaking. This is only one side of the coin. The financial support is uh, something else. This is especially true and relevant 
for such initiatives which are not commercially viable, but which are actually uh, um, required by the uh, social and the uh, communities, the interconnectivity uh, that exists in Europe has already, uh, uh, at the European level, has already provided some funding for 150 uh, funding programs in more than 100 uh, harbors in, in 22 member states of the Union with 1.5 million euros being spent since 2014. And this uh, funding mechanism has been in 22 actions spread out in 14 uh, French ports uh, with uh, 160 million uh, euros being distributed to the port authorities, uh, uh, providing liaison with the interland, but also digitalization and so on. The uh, call for uh, tenders and call for uh, offer services pertaining to alternative fuels do exist, uh, and there are even more possibilities. And I foster you, encourage you to think about uh, uh, this and, and to see for yourself what exists and to look into this uh, financial mechanism. So, ladies and gentlemen, the port and the cities are partners uh, in the uh, session at you have had today, this afternoon, you've just had actually, I've heard that uh, were presented very uh, practical, concrete uh, examples that do work. And some, I've heard, uh, I made a visit this morning uh, in the harbor of uh, Brest uh, with the same objective. Each uh, lesson that can be shared is, of course, very precious. We can learn. I encourage you all really to continue to share, to share, and I wish uh, you all all the best and to be successful. Dear Minister, thank you very much for organizing this event and uh, uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Commissioner. So I think in order uh, uh, we, should, we should make really a still picture. So to keep this in, in our memories, really. Head of staff, please, could you please come with the ministers? Merci à tous et...